Welcome everyone and thank you for attending our program today where we are going to explore the use of mindfulness meditation uh, to enhance well-being for people living with short bowel syndrome and their caregivers. And today I have with me Dr. Marian Winkler, who is professor of surgery at the Alpert Medical School at Brown University and surgical nutrition specialist at Rhode Island Hospital. We also have Dr. Jeff Brantley, who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Services, and founder and former director of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at Duke Integrative Medicine. And we're also excited to be joined by Andrew Jablonski, who is founder and director of the Short Bowel Syndrome Foundation, and also a person living with short bowel syndrome. So thank you all of you for joining me today. So my first question is for you, Dr. Winkler. A big area of focus right now in short bowel syndrome is on quality of life concerns for both patients and caregivers. So when we use the term quality of life, what exactly do we mean by that? And, and what are the biggest challenges that you've seen with your patients and caregivers in this area? Well, quality of life is really a very subjective term, and all of us may define quality of life very differently. And there's many different factors in each of our lives that could influence quality of life, both positively or negatively. In my research, uh, looking and, um, and interviewing patients on home TPN who have short bowel syndrome, they define quality of life as how much they enjoy life and being happy and satisfied with life and being able to do the activities and participate in events that they are really desiring to do. Um, many home TPN consumers describe being hooked up or tied down to the equipment, but they balance that with um, the energy and the strength and stamina and the feeling of health that they get with the nutritional therapy. Um, so they feel better and are able to participate in those activities, going to work and traveling or going to school and um, being able to do those desirable activities. One thing we know is that diarrhea and pain really influence quality of life. Those are two very, very strong factors that people living with short bowel syndrome usually talk about. Uh, Caregivers and family members also sometimes feel some guilt uh, about eating um, in front of people who may have uh, difficulty eating. Um, there's also dependency, um, and uh, sometimes these caregivers also avoid their own health and well being because they're busy taking care of others. Sometimes there's also worries about. Uh, complications or uh, fear of infection or even finances and other things going on in life that could impact quality of life um, negatively. One thing for sure, I think, to overcome all of this is to be able to define your quality of life and share your personal definition with your physician and your healthcare team. Thank you, Dr. Winkler. And, and Andrew, I'd like to turn to you as someone who is living with short bowel syndrome. What factors influence your quality of life the most? Um, I, I would say that uh, mental health factors, financial factors, and isolation factors play into my situation per se. Also, I uh, have daily distress and fatigue just from being out and doing the things that I'm doing. Like going to Target, going to different appointments during the day, walking around all day, it takes a toll on the body, it makes me fatigued. And then I pretty crash early at night. And I wake up early in the morning, but in between those hours, I have lots of sleep deprivation. I'll get up between the hours like two and four and have restless sleep and get on my computer and play around for a bit and I'll fall back to sleep until seven. Then I got to get up and do my daily routine. Um, and then finally, the financial and economic strain is a real thing. Um, I'm not made of a lot of money. I need uh, economic assistance from the state and from my parents to survive. Um, what I do doesn't make a lot of money at all. 
So I definitely feel that factor as an adult rather than when I was a kid. Uh, but isolation for me would be the main thing because even without being on TPN, there's isolating factors that come with short bowel syndrome. Yeah, to your point, Dr. Winkler and Andrew, this is, this is a lot to carry uh, for both patients and caregivers. Um, thank you for that perspective. And, and Dr. Winkler, um, what unique challenges do children and adolescents face? Well, it's interestingly, in a lot of the research, children, if they're asked about their quality of life, describe it much better than their parents or their doctors actually perceive their quality of life to be. And I think that may be because some children just have only grown up living with the short bowel syndrome condition or and or living on TPN. So they kind of get used to it. Uh, one factor that does get in the way with, of activities is the equipment, having a central line and having to be connected with a pump and being on a schedule. Uh, so oftentimes that could interfere with things like sleepovers or going to school or going to participate in sport activities or even traveling. But always there are strategies and resources that can be used to balance uh, those activities with with um, taking care of TPN and, and the medical condition very safely. So a lot of effort will be made to try to help children and adolescents take part in the activities they want to do. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Andrew, uh, um, can you speak on some of the challenges you faced when you were growing up as someone living with SBS? But when I was a teenager, um, I was very healthy for my age and for what I had. I was able to do some sports such as baseball, basketball in grade school. I did uh, cross country my freshman year in high school. I always been, have been able to travel even with TPN. Um, truth be told, when I did travel, I would ditch it at home for a week with my doctor's permission. That way I didn't have to go through the airport trouble. I didn't always do that. When I drove, I always took it. But uh, I always went to sleepovers as a kid. I usually hosted the sleepovers, though, because I had urinary incontinence and no one wants to pee at their friend's house on the floor. Um, which, well, it's true. Uh, school attendance and learning. Um, school attendance, I had relatively good school attendance. I didn't like missing school. In fact, there were many arguments with my parents about missing school or they'd have to block the door for me going because I was too sick. But uh, learning, that affects your learning by missing school and it can often turn into learning disabilities. Um, common factors are speech, uh, motor skills, and, so and social skills. Um, all those play into the school environment factor and usually some sort of support is needed for one of those three things. Andrew, did you ever um, experience or, or see maybe the, the child you're caring for experience any social anxiety or bullying or anything like that because of... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The bullying, for sure. Um, fifth grade almost kicked him out of school because he was bullied and he stood up for himself. And it was his word against the other kid. So there's some bullying, fifth, sixth grade. He's in eighth grade now, doing very well. Uh, but overall, he hates missing school. Okay, thank you. And, and Dr. Winkler, so for people who are not as resilient as Andrew, um, who might be experiencing some, some challenges in, in, in managing this process, what do you recommend um, to help enhance their quality of life? I think there are a number of things individuals can do. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's important to describe in your own words what makes quality of life good or bad. And that way we as healthcare team or other peer support um, can you know, help guide the person uh, or, or reach out with some strategies to improve quality of life. Some excellent resources are to find other people in similar situations. And uh, 
great options here are the Short Bowel Foundation, the Oli Foundation, other social media or Facebook sites where people living with short bowel or home TPN um, can meet and share experiences. Uh, some other individual things that people could do is journaling, journaling, writing things down, or using dance and art and music to ex express themselves as well as to de-stress. Um, I think getting ample sleep uh, because the fatigue is really important certainly is a helpful thing. Uh, and yoga and meditation um, are also uh, wonderful ways to um, give people renewed sense of well-being. All right, thank you. Okay, Dr. Brantley, I'm going to pivot over to you as we dive into the topic of mindfulness. What do you think the most important things are that people should understand about mindfulness? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Donna, and, and everyone else for making this available. And uh, I, I think um, something I learned in the years, my own practice years, which Probably the most important thing to start with is that uh, mindfulness uh, refers to the part of ourselves that we've all got, or at least as a potential. It's the part of us that is aware, that notices the way things are in the present moment. Our life is only in the present moment, and the part of us that notices. Uh, so like as you're sitting there or if you're listening to this, uh, if you pause for just a minute and just notice, you'll notice there's hearing, You'll notice sensations of your body. You probably notice your mind is talking about something, <laughs> reacting somehow with thoughts or other feelings. And, uh, and the part that notices is the mindfulness, and we all have it. Uh, so I say to people in the classes that we teach and the, le and the events like this, you don't have to create it. Uh, you're born with this sense of noticing, the awareness that notices. It's non-judging. It's uh, friendly, really, welcoming and allowing. And what we uh, need to do is to learn to recognize that part of ourselves that notices and to trust it and develop certain skills about uh, establishing ourselves in awareness in the midst of challenging situations. And, and most, most of all, really to kind of understand the mindfulness as a, as a way of empowering ourselves, of befriending ourselves to deal with whatever challenges life offers. So we've got all the mindfulness we need. There are many different uh, methods, you might say. I think about them as, um, as uh, depending on where we focus. But there's one mindfulness. And as we focus the attention, we gain more uh, understanding and connect more deeply with, with whatever is here with us in the present moment, whether it's our body, our breath, the thoughts, the emotions, uh, whatever it might be. Thank you, thank you. And, and so what do you see as some of the benefits of mindfulness meditation? Well, you know, there's a great deal of research about all this now. And of course, it's an ancient practice that uh, uh, in some traditions, notably the Buddhist tradition, it was offered as a, as a pathway to gaining freedom from suffering. And that's a much, uh, much discussed uh, word and everything else. In, in our modern era in medical science and psychological health science, uh, when we talk about suffering, John Kabat-Zinn uh, uh, talked about mindfulness-based stress reduction. And uh, again, we come back to this uh, notion that we all have all the mindfulness we need, and we can begin to understand our own personal experience of stress, whatever the stress or the stressors are, and we can be empowered to deal more uh, effectively. We like to say in the mindfulness-based stress reduction language, people learn to respond rather than react to the stressors. You know, the mental health improvement uh, that is research shows, depression, anxiety, and so on, uh, resiliency, um, uh, more objective, less reactive, um, improvement in sleep disturbances and uh, other sorts of uh, hyperarousal conditions. Uh, all of those uh, come back to the fact that we take a different relationship when we practice mindfulness to whatever is happening in the present moment. So, uh, so the benefits of the meditation are growing all the time. They're well documented in strong research, as well as some that's not so um, in the early days. But they all come back to this uh, empowerment to take a different relationship 
to the conditions we are experiencing in this moment inside and around us. That's such a great point, Dr. Brantley. And, and to, to what you just said, there is a growing body of research examining the use of mindfulness meditation in a lot of areas of health and well-being. And time and time again, it is showing these beneficial um, outcomes. And uh, also a lot of people probably think that mindfulness meditation is this tuning out or kind of t turning off maybe thinking, but to your point, it's actually um, being aware of what you're thinking and to what you said, befriending uh, what you're thinking so that you can uh, move through it more effectively. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's what we're trying to do is gain some wisdom but also learn how to access the parts of ourselves, the awareness and the good heartedness, I like to call it, the parts of ourselves where we can take refuge. On, in that same vein, because people may think that, that it is an escape um, or you're going into some deep uh, meditative state, that it might not resonate well with children or um, adolescents, but that's not true, is it? It's not. Uh, you know, again, this notion that mindfulness is something we're born with. We don't have to learn it or create it. It's important to learn about it <laughs> and maybe develop some skills of practicing um, and some experience with what happens when we practice. But we're born with it. And so it turns out that, uh, particularly in the field of education that I've heard about some, uh, uh, children really have, educators have taken to teaching children about mindfulness in different ways and and also uh, mental health professionals and others, um, because children are naturally available to be mindful. Um, I remember watching a video of a young, probably four or five year old girl uh, that was on one of the mindfulness uh, uh, conferences I attended, uh, a video of her, and said, so describe to the, you know, describe to us what is mindfulness. And she uh, talked in her little five year old voice, you know, and she says, imagine a snow globe and you turn it upside down, then you turn it back, and, and the snow is pouring down, and you just keep watching that snow and watching it, and after a bit, it's clear. And that's the way your mind is when you keep watching it. <laughs> that snow globe. <laughs> and this was out of the, you know, the, literally the mouth of a young child. So uh, I think that this is uh, something that all, all children and teens, if they're encouraged, can take advantage of. That's great. And, and um, yes, the research uh, does show there's, there's a lot of um, focus on mindfulness practices in um, early childhood education or um, higher education and in other um, environments with young people, uh, especially in children with rare diseases, um, inflammatory bowel disease is another example, uh, Crohn's, where the research continues to show that the use of mindfulness meditation supports those healthy responses to stress, helps them to um, learn better, uh, have more focused attention, uh, and then sleep better, and then improve their self-esteem. So, and this has been studied from children as young as five, uh, for example, all the way up um, to adolescent college and then beyond. So. Uh, it's very impactful. So Andrew, have any of your healthcare providers ever mentioned mindfulness meditation as a potential tool for you? Not in those exact words, but like they've given me like exercises, like deep breathing exercises, stuff like that. My therapist, psychotherapist, uh, never my GI doctor. And uh, it does help reduce the symptoms of depression and anxiety about that one particular situation and it does help me sleep better. I will say all those points are spot on. But uh, I, I was thinking about this as Dr. Brantley was speaking, uh, but mindfulness is not always at the forefront of your brain, especially when there's a disconnect between the intestine and the brain because of a short gut syndrome. Um, a lot of behaviors come into play, a lot of anger comes into play, and it's not always controllable. So let me, let me address a couple of those points. Uh, 
First of all, uh, Andrew, I think, you know, you are very much like people I've met that didn't have short bowel syndrome, but had anger. <laughs> or they came to our classes, they had they had a reason to be angry about something, you know. And uh, and many people came come with the idea that their, their thoughts, uh, you know, or, or whatever. But what I've come to understand about mindfulness is it's always here. We don't have to create it. It's always with us in the moment, but what happens is we can be forgetful about it. We can be uh, hijacked, really, by the intensity of our reactions in a given situation, whether it's anger or grief or, or whatever it is, or physical distress or whatever it might be. And so uh, it's, it can be useful to remember and have some experience practicing that in the moment uh, that we notice that we're angry, even in the middle of the storm, just noticing, well, anger is here right now. The part that notices is the mindfulness. And so uh, what we can do, and this is where the skill building and the practice can be very helpful, uh, we, we can begin to develop ways to reestablish ourselves in this moment in the situation and really uh, paying attention more closely as paradoxical as that sounds, or like people talk about breathing with the situation, you know, and letting yourself breathe mindfully. So feeling the breath, knowing the anger is here, knowing the pain is here. And these kinds of practices are not easy. Uh, people say things like, we can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. When we can make that shift, that pivot mindfully, we uh, protect ourselves against the future kind of reactivity or hypercharge around that. Uh, psychologists call it the difference between suppression and repression. At least uh, it, sometimes I've heard it put that way. Uh, but if we can actually mindfully step away from whatever is bothering us so much in this moment, we also uh, do not fall into actions and the reactions that, that later on we have to go back and clean up. Uh, with others and within ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Brantley. Um, and Dr. Winkler, how do you think your patients and caregivers might benefit from a mindfulness meditation practice or um, giving these types of things a try? Oh, I think that it would be highly desirable. I think becoming aware of how you're feeling is such an important um, uh, skill. And it's interesting, I think, in many of our interactions with our patients from the medical healthcare team side of things, we tend to focus more on the lab tests and the uh, diet, on the GI symptoms. And I think our patients are really more desiring of a holistic experience. So to be able to dialogue and engage in, in some of the other things um, I think would make better communication and uh, I think the totality of the care we give would be so much better if we can explore some of these, um, these activities and concepts together. So we do, we ask our patients, what do you do all day? What would you like to do all day? Do you have enough energy to do it? Uh, you know, and we talk about some of the psychosocial things and try to be aware or mindful on our own side about not just being stuck in the, the medical part of the disease or the therapy. Um, so for those watching, uh, as part of this program, Dr. Brantley has recorded a collection of mindfulness meditation exercises that are available on the activity page for you to listen to, download, and, and practice on your own. And each exercise is different uh, depending on your preference. So Dr. Brantley, can you just take a couple of minutes to give a brief overview of the available exercises so people have more information? Sure, Donna. We'll, uh, we'll do a, a short guided meditation of each of these different methods. And as I said before, there's one mindfulness, but there are different methods, you, is the way I think about it, depending on how we focus the attention. So uh, in the first one is a kind of an introduction to uh, Simply discovering, recognizing in yourself the, uh, the power to be, be mindful, to be aware. So the first uh, short one, about five minutes, available for anyone. And I'll, I'll probably focus on, uh, on uh, you know, picking a particular focus for attention is very 
important skill, as I mentioned earlier, talking with Andrew about the waves. <laughs> and, uh, and so we practice uh, finding a focus for the attention to help establish awareness and mindfulness. And, and a wonderful focus is always the breath sensations. And then very briefly, the other practices, body awareness is extraordinarily important. So we'll work with some body awareness practices and, and maybe a little bit of movement because that's always helpful at any age. And uh, also the stillness, uh, the, the, the awareness of the still body and just the sensations. Mindful seeing is a very powerful, any of our senses can be the object of mindful attention, eating, hearing, seeing, and so on. And so we'll, uh, we'll do a little short exercise to uh, practice seeing differently but if we mindfully see what's in front of us, like space, color, shapes, movement, stillness, all that, and we can practice uh, focusing our attention that way. It can really uh, uh, shift and even gladden our experience. And then the, uh, the longer meditation, the fourth one, will work some more with steadying the attention on what we've already practiced, the breath and the body. And I thought I would offer the last, if anybody would like, and you don't have to, but the last uh, maybe half of that or so, I'll offer suggestions uh, to, to help us reconnect, remember with that good heartedness, the kindness that we all carry, the great friendliness. Thank you so much, Dr. Brantley. And um, there's also a quick survey that will be on the activity page uh, for participants. And, and we'd be grateful uh, if everyone could fill it out and let us know if the information discussed today was helpful and what you thought of the meditation exercises. I want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Winkler and Andrew and Dr. Brantley for joining me today and sharing your expertise. Um, this is a very important topic and it is our hope that everyone listening, patients and caregivers, uh, will find value in exploring mindfulness meditation to enhance your well-being. And thank you for joining us.